Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining today's uh, webinar and welcome. Uh, my name is Jad Abiali. I'm the communications partner for Middle East and Africa at Guardian Glass. Guardian Glass is uh, one of the world's leading providers at arch of architectural and residential glass solutions, as you know. We are joined today by Mr. David Palmer, the CEO and, and founder of Fenestra Pro from Dublin, Ireland who is here to present to you about Guardian Glass for BIM and the passive considerations in facade design and their effects on the energy performance of a building. If you have any questions during the presentation, which we hope you will, please type them into the question box in your control panel on the right side of the screen. We'll bring them up at the end of the presentation where we will do our best to answer them. Also, please note that the webinar today is recorded. So therefore, if you like to ask questions and prefer to remain anonymous, you can check the uh, tick to be anonymous at the, at the right side of the screen in the Q&A section. And moreover, you'll also be notified via email uh, when the webinar is published live on our website to watch it again at your own leisure. So now we will turn the time over to uh, Mr. David Palmer, who would uh, uh, very quickly introduce himself and then we'll proceed. Thanks, Jad. Uh, good, to, good to talk to everybody uh, this morning in Dublin, obviously this afternoon where you guys are, so good afternoon. Uh, to very briefly introduce myself, and I'll give you some more detail in the, in the presentation, uh, David Palmer uh, is my name. I'm the founder and the CEO of Finestra Pro. Uh, very briefly, Finestra Pro has a uh, partnership and an initiative with uh, Guardian Glass, where we're providing access to our platform um, you know, to, and the Guardian Glass for BIM application in Revit. We'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through the presentation. As Jad said, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to uh, post them into the Q&A section and we'll deal with them towards the end of the presentation. Um, today, what I'm trying to, you know, obviously the, the uh, title of today's presentation is pr predominantly around the passive considerations in facade design and their effect on, on building performance. And, what the application and the platform is supports these considerations and these and this passive design approach to facade design uh, and that includes things like geometry in terms of the configuration of your glazing arrangements on your facades uh, as well as the glass specification which is a critical part of uh, controlling and understanding uh, the implications of percentage glazing uh, distribution of glazing and the actual performance of glazing in terms of thermal performance passive solar heat gain uh, and natural daylight uh, today, as part of the uh, webinar, um, we'll do a brief introduction. I'll have covered some of the stuff we wanted to talk about in that already. We'll talk about the importance of the facade um, understand, understanding, um, obviously, what the facade is and, and, you know, new and existing facades, but more importantly, how much energy the facade controls uh, within a building. We look at what those uh, consider, like, understanding passive design and what those considerations are and how we can control the controllables and we have a, a mantra here in Finestra Pro uh, what's measurable is manageable and by providing designers with an understanding from really early in the design process and that's from conceptual design all the way through to detail design and um, we can provide we can enable uh, an understanding that can address any concerns uh, in terms of the building performance from really from, from the earliest point in the process as well. We'll talk about the application, the platform and the application itself. Um, and then we'll look at, I suppose, the benefits and the functions of the application within the design process. So each stage of the design, whether it's conceptual, detail, schematic, detail design or construction documentation, we'll look at, I suppose, the range of considerations as we talk about them um, based on each design phase. Um, we'll also show you how to get access to the applications and the platform, uh, as well as the learning platform that we have. Uh, online as well. And then as uh, Jad alluded to already, uh, we'll have a question and answer session. So in the meantime, if you have any questions, please feel free to post them uh, in there. And if you want to remain anonymous, you can do so also. So by way of a, a brief introduction as, a, introduction, as I said, I'm the, the founder and the CEO of Finestra Pro. I'm an architect by trade. Um, and I also have a, a master's or specialism in facade design, facade engineering. Uh, I was a director of an architectural firm for over 10 years. I also lecture in the Dublin School of Architecture here in Dublin in relation to performance-led performance design and materials. So let's, I suppose, but to start off, I think really, you know, why, why would you consider 
uh, these passive design considerations as part of your facade design and, and you know what effect they have on energy performance and i guess the kind of core aspect of it is really what we're here to do is promote sustainability and reduce energy consumption so again by optimizing your facade design as i said from conceptual design all the way through to detail design and understanding the geometry and the materiality of what your selection uh, makes it uh, i suppose what you're doing is in that case you're optimizing the the, the design uh, and making it more energy efficient. And I think in the week that's in it, obviously uh, next week we have uh, COP26 in Glasgow. Um, and again, I suppose it's very topical in relation to energy and some considerations around that. But it's not just about energy performance. I suppose by optimizing your facade, one of the things that you're doing is you're improving the occupants experience of the building and the occupant comfort. So again, you know, looking at things like thermal performance in terms of heat loss, Passive solar heat gain, you know, controls the um, the requirement for your 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 cooling and your heating systems, but also makes it a more uh, in, uh, I suppose passive experience for the for the occupants as well. And one of the things that's important to note, and really I suppose from a developer's perspective or from the 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 the, the person who has um, I suppose funded the development or, or, or the project that you're working on. What you're looking at here is a low a lower capital expenditure. So again, by understanding the performance criteria and how that works, you're really just addressing it in a passive way. So in other words, your design considerations really don't mean that you're adding on sustainable, you know, you're sticking on solar panels at the end of a project to kind of meet sustainable goals. You're not spending extra money. What you're doing is you're getting it right from the get, get go. So therefore, you've got a lower capital expenditure. And as a result of optimizing the building, you really do have a lower operational expenditure as well. So you've got reduced cap capital expenditure and a lower operational expenditure for the life cycle of the building. Um, so I suppose what has BIM got to do with all of this sustainable aspect? And I guess there's a you know there's a value there to the user to the to the to the project where if we look at the the stages of design and this is a, a quite a well known and well rolled out um, uh, I suppose uh, theory into the Mac, it's known as the McLeamy curve and it looks at the impact of um, you know the ability to impact on the building performance as you go through the design stages. So very early pre-design. And the schematic design, you've got this idea where you can, you, you've got the ability to, uh, I suppose, influence and impact on performance, which reduces as you go through uh, the, the design process, but also through the life cycle of the, build, the building as well. Changes that occur uh, after that really uh, start to increase as you start to change that. And really what you're doing is, you know, when you're in that design for a process and you can see the cross of the two, um, the two, I suppose, parameters that we're talking about in terms of cost of the design, design changes and the ability. And um, prior, prior to that journey design is where you've really got that, uh, I suppose, ability to influence those passive considerations. And, and again, going back to that low CapEx and OpEx um, um, output at that particular point. So I'm sure everybody knows what a facade is at this stage, um, so I won't dwell too long on this. It's the external uh, skin of the building. It really, you know, it's two things from my perspective. As an architect, like really, you know, it is the building's architecture. So in conjunction with the mass of the shape of the building, the facade is the ar architectural response. And it gives the architect and the engineers the ability to, I suppose, to create that personality, to style the character, to set it in context um, within, the, um, within the, the urban or the suburban environment. Um, and very importantly, it is the moderator between your inside and your outside. So, you know, it really does control those things that are, that are important. It creates, you know, you know, that weathering barrier, uh, it creates security but also it influences energy performance, which is where we're, where we're, we're going to focus on today. Let me look at, I suppose, new facades. It's estimated that the floor area uh, of buildings is expected to double in the next 35 years. That's a heck, heck our way. And according to uh, Architecture 2030, the, the increase in floor area globally uh, will be, as I said, exponential over the next couple of years. There's obviously a lot of existing buildings, and if you consider the life cycle of existing buildings, um, and this is an interesting um, diagram, which is we've adopted as part, it's called shearing layers and how buildings learn what happens after they're built, is, you know, obviously the, the stuff that's in the building, that could be furniture, fittings, etc. Typical life cycle will be one year. The space plan will be typically between 25 and 30 years. HVAC systems, 
generally uh, need to be replaced after you know 20, 25 years, but we're putting down 15 to 30 years here. The structure can last 100 years. So again, you've got the ability to, I suppose, to create a structure that's going to that's going to outlive the rest of the components. But when you look at the skin, and um, what we're typically seeing is a is a life cycle of between 30 and 75 years. So again, of all the existing building stock that's out there, there will be a re requirement over the next few years to improve uh, the the envelope and you know really to kind of optimize that from an environmental and energy performance point of view which may not have been considered 20 30 years ago when and when the scheme was first applied to the structure so when we look at how much energy the facade controls i think this is a very useful diagram that we often use um, and as part of a piece of research in relation to um you know understanding low carbon built environment um in relation to engineering um, and the way we kind of look at that is we look at the total energy use associated with the facade. So we pick out the, the pieces that we're, we're looking at here. So in terms of heat loss, in terms of heat escaping through the building, we typically would lose around 12% of the energy through heat loss. And you can see there the walls, the floors, the roof, that would account for half of that. And the other half is actually accounted for within the window. So as you know, um, the glazing performs less well than a well insulated wall. Having said that, the glazing does offer huge amounts of advantages in terms of the other aspects that we're going to look at in terms of heat gain and in terms of natural daylight um, and, and how we control those things is what we're going to we're going to talk a little bit more about here um, but in terms of that heat loss again it's just providing that balance and the other advantage to the glazing as i'm sure you're well aware of the let's say the non-quantifiable uh, aspects in terms of the, the quality of uh, considerations in terms of the view in terms of the natural light and so on and so forth so we, we'll, we'll take a look at that as we go in terms of artificial lighting typically uh, accounts for about 20 percent 19 percent of the uh, energy being used in a building obviously you're not going to do away with the requirement for um natural light uh, at night time or sorry uh, artificial light at night time um, but again, what you want to try and do is reduce the usage of that, you know, during the daytime when there's natural daylight available and trying to maximise the natural daylight coming into the building and influencing that 19%. 26% is to do with your heating and cooling. So that's your ventilation systems and your cooling comfort, uh, your, so your comfort cooling system. So you're, again, your HVAC. Uh, and you can see that represents a significant portion of energy being used in the building itself. So 57%, over half of the energy being used in the building is controlled in some way, shape or form by the facade. Now, we're not saying that by getting it right, you're going to reduce the energy consumption by 57 percent. But going back to our what I talked about a moment ago, which is this idea of what's measurable is manageable. We can actually uh, control and, and optimize the use of that energy and try and reduce it in terms of the overall performance of the building uh, in a very low cost and um, in a very low cost and, and appropriate way. So you look at that in a global uh, context, and as we know, the built environment typically uh, would represent around 40% of total energy, global end energy use. Um, and commercial buildings would be about half that. And if you look at how the facade controls 57% of, let's just even look at commercial buildings, you can actually influence 10% of the global energy use in buildings going forward. And I think that's a, it's quite a, a striking consideration uh, when you look at it. And we're just looking at um, obviously the commercial building as end of things. But if you look at the residential end of things, it could be up to as high as 20%. So again, what I am saying is we're not going to reduce energy consumption by 20%, but we can certainly influence that 20% to be optimal uh, and reduce the consumption on that basis. And a reduction of consumption is really what we're, what we're focused on here. And again, it's understanding uh, how we reduce the impact of buildings on the environment. Uh, that idea of what's, you know, how you control the controllables as a designer uh, within the building, you can actually uh, influence how uh, the uh, building energy is being used to control from a passive considerations point of view. So very briefly, and we'll talk a little bit more about this as we go through the stages and the considerations on each stage, but Guardian Glass for BIM, which is powered by Finestra Pro, uh, is a web platform uh, and an Autodesk Revit plugin that functions within the BIM workflow to demonstrate the environmental performance implications of glazing design and specification options. Those two things that we look at, as I mentioned, is materiality in terms of the glass specifications, choosing the right glass with the right solar heat gain coefficient, visible light transmittance from a daylight point of view, 
and um, a, the, the right U value from a thermal perspective. And uh, so that kind of comes together and you'll see this as we go through the, the next few stages. So what do we mean by passive design? So again, using geometry and materiality to reduce or remove mechanical heating, cooling, ventilation and lighting demand. Really what it is, is focusing on energy efficient design. There's a couple of the three, the three kind of core parameters that we look at within that. The first is how we manage our overall thermal performance. And the considerations within that will be things like glass to wall ratio. So we mentioned earlier on that glazing in terms of a thermal performance value doesn't perform as well as a well insulated wall, for example. Um, but you know it's, it has an important part to play in the overall um, performance of the building in terms of those quantitative and qualitative uh, aspects. So again, understanding glass to wall ratio. So in other words, if you can understand the requirement for the thermal performance for your entire envelope or skin, including the roof and the floor, uh, we can, we can you know, I suppose, um, extract from that what we need for the facade. And when we have, a, have our U values for our wall and our glass, you, you're able to establish a, a glass to wall ratio. So again, very often people are using rules of thumb. In some instances, there's code and regulations that limits it to 40% glazing. Um, or we can control how we can how you can manage that. So again, you might establish that 40% glazing, but increase, improve the performance of the glass or the wall or both, and be able to increase beyond the 40% and and, and prove uh, that it still complies with what's what's required. It's on thermal performance. So your glass glazing systems and wall systems, the U values associated with that, which feeds into the overall process. We're also looking to optimize daylight. So again, uh, what are you know those considerations in terms of the configuration? So in other words, how much glass you have, where it's located. You know the idea that if you have um, a, a window, uh, the you know the what you want to try and do is maximize the height of your your the head height of that glazing to allow maximum daylight to come in and penetrate and distribute across the space. And um, so the configuration is important, but also the performance of the glass. So you can. Glass technology has moved on so much these days, as you're probably aware, and I won't get into the detail. I'll leave that to, to the to, to Guardian to talk about the, the vi visible light transmittance of glazing. But again, with the solar control glazing that we have out there, we can reduce the heat gain uh, quite dramatically while maintaining the, the amount of daylight that's coming into the building. And really what the application does, it links those two things together. So you've got a product that has a huge benefits from an environmental point of view in terms of reducing solar heat gain coefficient, but also maximizing your daylighting and how that all, all those, I suppose, how we can measure what that the impact of those things on the building and using using BIM as the, the I suppose the method to do that and the application supporting tool around that. Um, and also, yeah, the percentage of external. So we look at design daylight factors. So we don't get into detailed design autonomy in terms of what where the light is, but we just look at the the distribution of the external light into in through the facade and across the um the what we call the perimeter zone of the building, which is the six meters from the external facade. Similarly, what we're also doing is we're looking at optimizing our solar gains. And what we're trying to do there is reduce <coughs> our requirements for our heating and our cooling. So again, this is a, the 26% that we talked about. So what we're trying to do is maximize your heat gain, um, but really consider how that heat gain uh, is managed within the building itself. So again, where you've got um, uh, excessive heat gains, you have excessive cooling. And as you're probably aware, cooling costs three times more energy and also from a cost point of view than let's say heating the building. So what you want to try and do is maximize your heat but stop the building from overheating and we've got some guidance that, that provides you an understanding as to how to do that. There are other factors that play in, in play a part here is seasonality, you know, across the year, variations across the year in terms of what those heat gains might look like in terms of orientation as well. Um, but also, you know, the solar heat gain coefficient of the glazing. So how much the glazing can reduce your heat gain uh, within that while trying to maintain your daylight. So again, it's these kind of balance, the balanced aspect. Um, and we can look at how we distribute the glazing. So we have glass to maximize your heat gain, maximize your daylight, but also, um, you know, minimize your, your heat loss. So we've got these three parameters that we're focused on, thermal, solar, that are often working against each other. So again, where you're trying to maximize your daylight, increase the amount of glazing, you're increasing the solar loads and hope, you know, and probably overheating the building. So you've got to control that and um, but also maintain your daylight levels. Thermal is a really thermal performance requirements are really interesting because again, that's where the code kicks in. So you'll see in the application we can set the codes in various locations 
and look to achieve uh, what we're trying to achieve within that itself as well. Okay, so what we're going to do is, um, I think the best way to look at what, how this will work, we'll look at, you know, I suppose what those considerations are in each design stage. And we talked about the idea that, you know, what the applications platform will do is it really engages you at that conceptual design stage. And you can very quickly iterate through alternatives based on performance requirements and, and information from that earlier stage. So the orientation, the distribution of glazing. One of the key aspects of what we do is we look at, you know, I suppose the um, the impact of surrounding buildings. So again, where surrounding buildings are providing shade and shadow, uh, that's taken into, cons into consideration and account uh, when we're calculating the overall heat gain. And really at that early stage, what we're trying to do is establish a Let's call it a performative specification. So, in other words, very early stage, understanding what the requirements are in terms of the performance. So, we're heat gain coefficient, visible light transmissions, and U value. As we move into the schematic design, we're getting into more detailed configurations where the application can automatically generate windows, punched windows, or curtain wall systems. Uh, based on performance, so it's kind of performance-led design. Um, we've got that intuitive specification, so again, if you're not using performance to lead the design, when you have something designed, then it's understanding the appropriate specification and how that impacts on the, the building performance. All the while, and one of the great advantages of being a Revit add-in, as, well as, the, the, as well as the platform, is that it's providing this information in real time. So in other words, it's giving that information back to you, where it's telling you, you know, you know what your, what your perform, uh, performance data is as you make these changes in real time. We can demonstrate compliance with local code. We'll talk a bit more about that and generate um, specifications. As we move in, you're getting into more detailed specification. You might be uh, taking a bespoke piece of glass from Guardian Glass Analytics and bringing it in here. Uh, uh, you know, again, that real-time performance information and, and you're able to generate those reports again. As you move in, it's more about, you know, I suppose the, the quantified building geometries, materials and so on. So look, what we're going to do is we'll take a look at each individual stage and we'll have a short video that demonstrates some of the functionality within the application. Um, hopefully it'll take us about 10, uh, 10 or 15 minutes to get through and we, we'll, um, we can touch on how you get access to the application at the end. So again, just to be, from, I suppose, to kind of front end this, um, Guardian and Finesta Crow have a, a, a partnership agreement and this initiative will mean that everybody uh, has access to um, Guardian Glass or BIM platform and, and subsequently the Revit application for a period of 18 months for free. It's, well, for free, uh, it's sponsored by Guardian, so Guardian are, are paying for the usage of this. Um, and I'll show you how we get access to that at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the presentation. So we mentioned it already and again, you know, from early stage in the conceptual design stage, Really, at that stage, what you're doing is you're, mass, you're, you're creating shapes and masses and looking at how you, I suppose, that the building form, uh, and then obviously how that feeds in with the building function in terms of performance. So again, the effects on massing, the percentage of uh, glass to wall ratio, uh, and the thermal performance. Uh, I think that video should play automatically, yeah, which it does. So you'll see here within the application, you can create your own code. So again, depending on where you are, uh, you can set your performance requirements for your roof, your floor, your your walls and so on. Uh, and, uh, and then you can apply that and you can see here where it's reading from the, uh, you know, from the application and it's telling you where you're uh, non-compliant from that perspective. And in this instance, we're going to put on 40% glass and you'll see from the application, it automatically generates, you know, the 40% glazing. Now, I suppose the important thing to know within uh, the conceptual design tools versus the, I'd be interested actually to know how many people are using conceptual design in Revit, but the big difference here is conceptual design we're using is what we call paper thin walls and, and what, what's described by Autodesk in Revit as notional windows. So again, uh, the application Revit doesn't store that data uh, within the application, but we do it within the Guardian Glass for BIM application itself. So again, that's where you set your thermal performance for your walls, your glass, your roof, and so on. That's where you establish glass to wall ratio, and you can see it's automatically writing that configuration to the model, as we just saw. Um, and I suppose the, the key aspect of that is, that is storing that data. So as you move through the process, it's reminded of what that information is within the application itself. I suppose the next part of it is understanding orientation, uh, uh, distribution of glazing and the effects of surrounding buildings. So if you see from this particular video, um, what we do is based on, we can we take solar data from anywhere in the world. So 
obviously in Revit in your energy settings, you'll have located the building. From there, we're able to kind of look at the building use, set the occupancy better when the building is in use, and you'll see here, download the, and I'm just gonna pause this for a moment, download the solar data uh, for each orientation. <clears throat> and you can see here we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven orientations, because you've got this little kicker in the building. Um, and what we'll do is we'll download the solar data for that, but also depending on the inclination of the plane. So if you've got an inclined plane or several inclined planes, you'll have additional data points for the orientation and the and the, the solar load for that orientation and inclination. So you'll see here, it's fairly straightforward. They're all 90 degree facades uh, and the various orientations are listed. The other thing we're going to do at this point is we'll calculate the shading. So you'll see in the model we've surrounded, we've developed or we've set out <coughs> some surrounding buildings. And what we'll do is we'll calculate the shading for that. Now this happens once and it takes a couple of minutes to download and calculate that information. But that information is then cached and stored uh, within um, the application itself. So you don't have to do it again. So you do it once uh, unless you change the orientation or unless you do something uh, quite dramatic, you don't have to do that again. But you'll see here then um, what we're doing is we're able to establish what that looks like. And with that information, then we're able to work out what our solar loads are on each facade and what our daylight uh, levels are like on, on those and what the shading is as well. Uh, this function enables us to automatically distribute the glazing around the building to get the, the facades performing as closely as possible from a from a uh, solar heat gain point of view, but invariably, let's say in the northern uh, in the northern hemisphere, you'll end up with more glazing on your north side because it's a lower solar uh, uh, solar load than on your south side. There is an ability to go in there and change that, so you might end up with let's say 30% glazing on your safe facade, but you want that to be the main facade, so therefore almost 100% glazed. So you can go in, you can set that, lock it down and distribute the rest of the glass to the rest of the building. And there's an iterative supporting process around that. So you'll see here where we're able to kind of navigate through our facades through the application. In this case, we're selecting uh, three south facing facades on different floors. And um, we're, we're going to look at an alternative glass within that. But another consideration is that if you don't get uh, to the requirements in terms of with just the glass, we can also look at how we can introduce some shading to complement the glazing selection. So again, in this case, you'll see where we're looking at a horizontal canopy, and then we're looking at the, the extent of the extension or the, the amount that it comes out or the side extension. So you'll see here as we do that, it automatically generates the, the, the I suppose, the conceptual shading devices within the application, and that feeds into your daylight levels and your, uh, and your heat gain levels. Now, it's important to note, you know, the, the, you know, obviously this is it. we're here with Guardian and, and we are really about promoting the use of glass to control these matters. The adding shading in here will have a negative effect on your daylight. So again, what you're doing is by putting a shading device, depending on the shading device, but let's say just talking about harmful canopies, if you put a horizontal canopy in, you're reducing your visible sky angle, therefore your depth of penetration and your average distribution of the daylighting is less. If you're just using a solar control, glass where you can reduce your heat gain by in some cases up to 80 percent yet maintain your daylight level at a reasonable level you know you're, you're not interfering with how that glass is distributed and really um the, the shading tools within the application is to support the glass selection just to kind of um where you're not getting um the required heat gains or getting the heat gains down low enough um you know we can we can guide on 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 the shading devices around that um it's probably a good opportunity to just point out the fact that um you know, I suppose that glass configuration and how we embed that information and being within the workflow gives us this ability to to read and write from uh, the model. Uh, sorry, read from and write to the model, uh, particularly in the detail stage. But in conceptual design, you're still going to use this notional idea. And if you can imagine, you know, that particular project that we just looked at, probably, you know, surrounding buildings, all you're doing is creating mass, mass objects, which will create the shading. In the detail, uh, sorry, in the actual building you're working on, you what you lose your create floors and you can create spaces. So very quickly, you can establish a very uh, a very rough model, and and a number of design criteria to meet around that in an iterative kind of way. Uh, so it's very uh, effective in that kind of conceptual design. We'll also look at uh, that early stage. Sorry, I think I've just gone. Uh, yeah, so again, when we've established your glass to wall ratio, we might look at different um, configurations within that. Um, and we can look at then how different glass types can impact on that. So again, you've got the ability to log in, to select the facades that you want to do. So we've got the navigator, you can select various facades. Then you can search by highest solar heat gain to lowest solar heat gain coefficient, similar with VLT, similar with U values. You can use the 
uh, the slider bars to kind of refine what you're selecting for. And this is based on, um, and at this early stage, it would typically be based on the performance of the material as opposed to the building. And then you can review how that material acts on the building. We guide, just again, just to, to point out, we guide on uh, heat gain in terms of anything over 25 watts per meter squared is an overheat, is, is guided as an overheat. You can choose to do that. Uh, but once you're aware of how much overheating you're causing within the building, it's probably just a, a where and you'll see that within the charts go red. Anything less than 15, it's, it's blue. So that's our kind of, you're not maximizing your heat gain as you see here, it's blue. Um, so what you're trying to do is trying to get it between that, what we call the green, the sweet spot between 15 watts and 25 watts per meter squared. On the daylight, design daylight factor, uh, SIBSI and ASHRAE guide that 2% design daylight factor is your minimum, 5% is optimal. So what we're trying to do again is design and guide within that two to 5%. Anything over 5% glare becomes a consideration that you have to, to look at as well. So again, very conceptual ideas here that you're able to you know, rush through iterations as, as quickly as you can. You know, it doesn't take long to produce one of these conceptual uh, models and we've got guidance within, the app, within our supporting uh, material uh, that will give you um, guidance as to how you can very quickly mass um, I suppose, um, uh, on a basis of floors and spaces within that as well. So we move into schematic configuration, I suppose schematic, schematic design. We can look at, you know, I suppose applying those, you may have established the distribution of glazing and you may have overridden some of that to give yourself a lot of glass on your site facade, for example, as the, the example we used. Um, and now it's a case of kind of, you can, I suppose, get into the configuration. We're into the detail modeling section. So the big difference here, as I mentioned earlier on conceptual design, we store all the data within the conceptual design application, but within uh, the detail design, all the information is written back to, to Revit, to the BIM model itself and embedded within that. And that's what you, we will show you today as well. So you'll see here where we've got this kind of blank um, facade, which we think is, sorry, is, wet, is west facing. So you can select within the application, you can select from the objects within the model. So your facades or surfaces within the model, or you can use the, our, uh, the facade navigator to um, to rename and to group different facades and surfaces. In this instance, we're going to create windows. So we're just going to look at punched windows. So you'll see here we've got a target solar load of 15 watts per meter squared. We're going to put in a rough configuration. So we're going to say 1.2 by 3 meters wide. Um, we're going to equally spread them across the facade. Uh, and then what we can do is we can preview windows. So you can see with this climate guard selection uh, in the in the glazing um, you know, we get, I think it's something like, that looks like about 18 windows in that case. But if you go with it, let's say, and to, we're going to exaggerate to make the point here, so we're going to go with the SunGuard Silver, which is a really low, really low solar heat gain coefficient of about 0.1, but it does have a lower VLT as well, which is a consideration. Uh, you'll see in this instance, when we preview it, we've got 27. So you can increase the amount of openings based on performance to meet the performance. And again, you'll see that, I suppose, better used uh, at different points. When you apply that to the building, then you can uh, you understand the requirements. So we set a, a heat gain of uh, 15 watts per meter squared. In this instance, I think we have something that's quite low. It's down and around the, I'm gonna wait for this three, so three. So again, because we went over the top in terms of the amount of glass that we, we the amount of windows that we want. And actually you can see it's like a, more like a curtain wall and a punched windows. But again, we just wanted to make the point. I think, sorry, let's go back there a little bit. Uh, and you can see, what happens when we select the glazing uh, and apply it to the building, we actually were applying that glass. It goes into what they call the constructions XML file within Revit. And you can see here, uh, it's giving you a family type uh, and the glass type selection within that as well. So you can see what the solar heat gain coefficient is, diffuse solar transmittance uh, and so on and so forth. So again, that's just to, 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 to be aware that when you uh, select your glass, it embeds it within the, the, the Revit model itself. I suppose that's where we can see uh, that. Um, the intuitive specification. So again, what we looked at a moment ago was using performance and material to drive the geometry. In this case, you've already got a configured geometry. You can see here, uh, as we select a surface, you can see here the uh, how that heat gain uh, plays out across the year, and you can see significant heat gains here. So we can then, um, we can look at alternatives around that. So we can say, okay, well, these are the three surfaces that we're looking at. So let's set, um, our daylight, minimum daylight to about five or nearly close to six. We'll select our 
uh, heat gain down below that 25 watts per meter and we'll, we'll leave that U value. And you can see it's limiting our choice of glazing to these two particular glass types that, that meets those criteria. And as we start to adjust this, you can see uh, more glazing uh, coming into play there. But again, as we go down lower, there's mainly just one glass approach. So basically what we're using is um, almost like an, a, a form of artificial intelligence to kind of to refine your selection of glass to meet the performance criteria. So earlier on, we saw the ability to select glazing based on the glazing properties. Now we're looking at how those glazing properties play on the building. And you can see here significant reductions in those heat gain figures as you go across each particular uh, month within that as well. And the glass specification is also embedded within the application or within Revit itself. Uh, also within this, we'll look at very briefly, we can look at individual surfaces. We break that down into monthly uh, values. We can look at peaks and troughs. So again, we can look at the average, which we looked at a moment ago, and we also look at peaks. So within those months, we also have high peaks uh, and we can address those. But again, when you address a high peak, uh, the average will drop significantly around that. So you, you'll see that. So again, it's uh, iterative. And it's that idea of what's measurable is manageable. If you can see and understand um, what that performance looks like, you know, you can address it, be it geometry or, or materiality, as I talked about. And again, you can navigate through your, your surfaces and so on uh, accordingly. Uh, and you can see here where we've still got one particular surface to address. And by the way, uh, I should also say you can apply glass to one section of the building or one surface. And we define a surface, by the way, I should probably say this earlier. A facade is obviously one facade that's orientated, that's 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 grouped as one. Um, Within that, then we have surfaces, which is the breakup based on floor plates and also on uh, rooms. So a space, a surface will be um, a part of the facade that's associated with the space behind that. And uh, just to be clear about what that what that definition is. And you can see here how we can navigate through. Um, also within this groups and, and filters, we can create groups. So you might have a ground floor retail. So you can group all the ground floor retail together and call it ground floor retail and have a glass specification specifically for that. Or you can have the office buildings above and, and create a group for the for that. So again, it's hugely beneficial in terms of understanding the performance of, I suppose, components, but also spaces within the building as well. So again, um, you know, we can we can talk a little bit more about that as we go through. The other thing that we like to, we, that we can do is, is we can gem, demonstrate code compliance and generate reports for code compliance that you can use for ComCheck or for uh, LEED or BRIAM, whatever it might be. Um, so you'll see here where we can click the, the COM button. So, um, you know, we can create the file name, which is an Excel sheet. We save that. Um, and you'll see here where we have the project data, but we also have the full breakdown of the components within the project that you will need to cross input into whether it's com check or whether it's uh, one of the the tools for for compliance checking and you'll see within that then you will have all the areas of the glazing you'll have all the specifications in terms of u value solar heat gain coefficient and vlt which is required for your compliance checking uh, in addition to that we also have an ability to create your own charts and graphs so we can do what we call a snapshot and it's important to note a snapshot is a moment in time when you're designing through the building so you might have several snapshots as you're iterating through so you can call it, call it what, you, what you will. So in this case, we'll call it report. The tab within the report will be uh, report one. We we'll create the spreadsheet and you'll see here at the bottom, we have report one. So just to go back a little bit there, we'll have the summary sheet of the project information uh, and when the report was generated as the snapshot. I mean, you'll have, you'll see here where we're getting overheating, we're getting, you know, variations within the heat gain across that year. We look at peaks and troughs. We look at design daylight factor and the specification associated with each of those particular components as well. So again, that gives you the ability to create a snapshot where you can bring it into Excel and generate as many charts and graphs as you want. Also, alternatively, you, you can do so within the Guardian Glass platform. So you can export the report information to that. You'll see your glass specification. You'll see a solar low rows and uh, it looks at the solar load for all the various orientations. And then we have surface level heat gain. So you can see what those heat gains are in different surfaces. Uh, you can see where there's no glass on particular surfaces. We've got a full breakdown of that information as well. And the great thing about this is that you can also customize your own reports and graphs and charts. So you see here, we've got a lot of various uh, information for each facade or each surface that you can select. And then you can create um, various alternatives, whether it's a spline, a line, uh, uh, columns and so on. So again, you can create these charts and graphs that you can use in your own uh, presentations by exporting the, the actual uh, files themselves. So that's as you move into schematic design and really when you get into that, that kind of late stage detail design. So what we tend to see is people using the, the, the glazing database. So if, 
within the application, and it's all, by the way, it's very important to note as well, and I'm going to try and wrap up in the next five minutes, so bear with me. Um, we within the um, within the kind of early stages, you're using the, the database. So again, these are kind of six, twelve, six class types that you can use and embed. Um, but the alternative to do this as well is that we can also bring in as you move into the detail process, where you're looking at um, uh, more, I suppose, configured glazing with different thicknesses and different properties. And again, there's many thousands of iterations of this that can be generated. So again, you can use Guardian Glass Analytics, which I'm not going to go into in a huge amount of detail. In fact. I'll flick through it a little bit faster. Uh, when you've generated or configured your, your own glass type, you can use uh, the Guardian Glass Analytics to export to uh, Guardian Glass for BIM. When you export the makeup, it appears within the database, your own database, in which case you can, uh, you, when you log on to the application, it could be available. You can also share this glass type, and so too can your Guardian rep. So again, if you're looking for a configured glass from a rep, they can share this with you as well. And you can see here when we toggle through, you'll see custom seven or custom two, three, five, which is the glass type we just created. It's available to you within the application, which again, you can you can then embed into the into the model itself. And I mentioned, and as I said, it gets embedded. I mentioned a moment ago, the ability to share glass. So we're just looking at that, how we configure that glass and you can see how um, that glass might address your particular concerns uh, to, to meet those heat gains and daylight levels and so on. Um, OK, so again, looking at individual facades and surfaces and look at the heat gain associated with those. Um, as you're into construction documentation, really what we're looking at is how we, we use the glass makeups, those configured glass makeups. And again, it's generating that data that's used uh, at the various different stages. If we switch to our default list, there was the glazing that we just brought in. Uh, as I said, custom 235, we can share that by email with another user uh, or, or a rep can share with you or you can share with a rep and make sure that you're uh, correct in how you do that. So you can share that information and it, it'll appear within the, uh, you can see that it's shared and it'll appear within the application. The person will get an email saying that some of you shared a glass type with them. You can log on and look at how that uh, plays out on your on your building itself. So you can see these guys, Architects ABC, having access uh, or accessing the application. You can see the new glass type that's been shared with them. Uh, you can look at the details around that and you can apply it then to your building as you go through uh, within that as well. So look, in the interest of time, I'll just keep moving. Um, I suppose just to very briefly discuss the key benefits from uh, a user's point of view. As you can tell, it enables intelligent selection of glass, that's be it from the database or a configured piece of glass. And it really, as I mentioned earlier on, what we have is the BIM model, which is an intelligent model um, that we can store and, and read information to and from. Uh, we also have, you know, these, I suppose, advanced glazing products, be it within the database and your, some of your solar control glass, or be it something configured within glass analytics uh, where we can bring it all together and and select the glass based on the building performance as opposed to selecting glass and hoping it meets performance. Once you've selected that glass, you can embed that performance information into the model. So for example, if you're doing more detailed analysis in something like Inside 360 or um, whatever it might be, uh, you can actually, uh, the, the glass is embedded, so it will actually feed into that process as well in terms of your overall energy performance. And just to be clear, we don't do overall energy performance. We look at the performance of the facade. Advanced modeling and advanced um, uh, considerations are, are taken in um, and they'll verify and validate our information. By, I suppose, by understanding and getting the glass specification and configuration right from the get go, it eliminates the requirements of late stage redesigns. What we've seen there in a number of occasions is that ability to, um, I suppose, streamline the process, eliminate late stage redesign as a result. I see Jad appearing there, and that's my cue to kind of wrap up, but really, isn't it, Jad? Um, and really, as I mentioned at the start, that's <laughs> okay, we're okay on time. Really, as I mentioned at the start, what we're all about is improving performance. You know, I know uh, it's a big consideration now in most countries, uh, including yours. Um, but again, it's understanding, um, you know, what's again, sorry for repeating what's measurable is manageable. And again, we can measure what's going on and understand and improve building performance to optimize the facade. And when you get into that later stage, detailed analysis, when it comes to overall energy performance, you'll, you'll be comfortable in the knowledge that your building is optimized. OK, so to talk very briefly um, about the app, about the application and how you can get access to it. I know some people, perhaps some of the people on the call have already done We have had a lot of activity within the region and um, so we can. Um, this is what will happen. So we're providing sponsored access um, sponsored by Guardian 
uh, for 18 months. This includes free unlimited use of the Guardian Glass uh, for BIM Revit application, uh, access to the Guardian Glass web platform, including the learning platform, which we'll talk about in a moment, uh, unlimited support from Finestra Pro. So we're always here to help and we're willing and, 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 and well able to support you within your, uh, within, your, within your activities in terms of the project and select glass selection. Um, the package is worth, because it's an 18 month subscription, it's worth over 2000 US dollars um, and it's, you know, it's certainly, uh, you know, valuable uh, piece of kit to apply. Uh, and Jad, I might ask um, to uh, post this in the in the chat box, which is the Guardian Glass for BIM uh, web. So finestrapro.com forward slash Guardian hyphen glass hyphen for hyphen BIM. And that gives you um, an ability to uh, create, uh, to complete an application form uh, where you put in your name, your details, your email address, the size of the firm you're working for, your location. Very importantly, we would also ask you to include the address of your guardian contact. It's really important because we've got to validate that you're a, uh, an approved user. So um, you've got to include the, the email address of the guardian glass contact. So we know who to follow up with to make sure it's valid. Once we get that validation done on an approval, you'll receive an email. The email looks something like that. From here, you can click here. It'll take you to a place where you set up. It's very simple. You confirm your email, you'll set up a password. From there, then you'll have access to the application and within the application, you'll also have access to the, the reports, the glazing makeups, um, the ability to download the application, uh, link to Guardian Glass uh, support and the analytics and the website. Clicking on the training and learning. So we've developed, a, I suppose, a series of modules um, that trains people in the use of the application. And again, it's, it's not just about Guardian Glass, it's about performance and about understanding. So we've got, the introduction and um, a lot of stuff we've covered here today uh, we've got you know how to get started how you set up your account again it's really straightforward so if you can see that within um you know i suppose what's that 35 minutes you get a good understanding and get started <clears throat> then we've got two core modules one is on the conceptual model functionality which is the stuff we touched on earlier on uh, creating conceptual mass models the energy settings applying glass to wall ratio and so on it's 30 minute module the biggest module we have is on the detail functionality. Again, understanding the various components of that. Um, one of the things that we are often challenged with, and again, it's how people model and everybody models differently. And it's, you know, um, you know, some people model to a good standard, some people don't. But again, it's understanding what those standards are and how you might address. So if you're an engineer, for example, receiving a model from an architect, what do you need to do to streamline that? Diagnose any problems with it, fix those issues and simplify the model. So it's a really interesting module that we've just added, uh, especially to, to do that. In addition to our learning platform, we also have our support. So we've got a, a very, you know, all your questions can be answered in our Guardian, uh, sub, Guardian hyphen support dot pro dot com. Uh, this is where you'll also download the application. You get access to this from the platform once you get your uh, username. Uh, we also have dedicated support from uh, our from Jared Benson. So Jer is available to provide you with any uh, information you need to, to get you started, get you running. Um, and when it comes to those technical queries, we've got Mike, uh, Mike Flood, who I think is on the call as well, uh, available to support you. And if you have any comments, questions, um, dare I say abuse, uh, please feel free to uh, reach out to me at dpalmer at finestrapro dot com and hopefully we'll be able to answer your questions and get you guys up and running. Jad, how am I doing on time? We have 10 minutes for q and A. I have no idea. Uh, have we any questions uh, so far? But I'll leave it to you to, to kind of streamline great. it to me. Absolutely. Thank you so much, David. It's a great presentation, very informative. Um, so I, before I go into a q and A, I just want to remind everyone. So in the in the chat box, you could see that there are two links. There are um, you know, you, you could see the level of value that we, we are making possible for you here with David and Finestra Pro. Um, so, you know, if you have a current or any future project that you can think of that you, you'd like help with, we can provide that help. Let us support you as as glass experts. And, and um, you know, there's the other link in the chat box that is for you to get yourself um, on board with with uh, with a BIM account which will provide, we will uh, make useful for you. Um, so uh, we have a question here from uh, David, uh, a gentleman named Diab, and he is asking, what is the most effective parameter in terms uh, of the glass performance for reducing the heat through the glazing? 
Yeah, uh, thanks Diab, uh, and, and thanks for being on the call as well today and, and goes out to everybody. Um, the most important one would be the, you know, obviously selecting glazing with the lowest solar heat gain coefficient. So one of the examples we gave there, we, we selected the Sungard Silver, uh, which has a, a very low solar heat gain coefficient. However, with that particular glass type, the trade-off uh, is around the visible light transmittance. So because it's a silver coated glass, it really it reduces your your heat gain by 90 percent which is phenomenal but it also it's it's because it's got that silver coating it's it's quite tinted it also reduces the visible light transmittance so that's on one extreme so my point is solar heat gain coefficient is the value that you're looking for the lower that is and um, the higher the reduction so as i mentioned point one is a 90 percent reduction point two is an 80 percent reduction and so on and so forth uh, the trade-off really, as I said, is to try and select the glass with the lowest solar heat gain coefficient but with the highest VLT, because what you're trying to do is reduce your heat gain while maintaining your daylight. And Guardian have a fantastic range of products that can do that, uh, and that does apply to it. So again, solar heat gain coefficient for your, reducing your heat gain, but balanced with the VLT um, to make sure that you're getting the right level of daylight. So we talked earlier on about these competing forces, if you will. Um, but again, as I said, once you understand what, what impact that has and how that plays in, you can make the right decision. Um, does anybody from Guardian want to add into, into that, Jad? Is that a um, fair, fair comment? Yes, uh, David, thank you so much. We have uh, no response from, from Diab, so I hope this is um, addressed. Uh, Diab, if you still have you know further questions or you'd like us to follow up with you on this question, please fill up the form. We'll be happy to get back to you about it. Um, well, I would say as well, yeah. uh, Jad, while, while I see somebody as well uh, requesting that I speak slowly, my apologies. I was trying to speak as slowly as I could, um, but you should see me on a on a fast day. Um, so hopefully you got most of the presentation, but I should probably apologize. Um, we went through a quite a bit of information and I just wanted to make sure we covered everything, particularly I probably got faster as we went rather than slower. So my apologies for that. But what I would say is part of our support, if you sign up one or two people or three or four people from your firm, we can do, a, 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 um, I suppose, a, um, a webinar presentation within the firm where we can deal with individual projects uh, or individual or, or group of projects. And we're, we're very happy to do that and support you that way. Thanks, David. So we don't see any new questions coming in, so we're going to uh, maybe wrap this up unless you'd like to add any uh, further comments or you'd like to reflect back on a little bit or probably the most important part or your favorite part of the presentation, maybe just to leave people with that um, sentiment. Yeah, and again, you know, we, we talked about the, the, you know, the COP26 that's happening at the moment. I know, you know, governments are making commitments to reduce energy consumption. I suppose all of us, you know, we're all individually looking at ways we can um, influence our, you know, energy use uh, on a personal level. Um, and I suppose on a professional level, what we're trying to do is give you guys the tools to, you know, to make a big difference in, in what really matters in terms of the design. And that's what that's what the aim of uh, today. And I hope it came across uh, that way. And I think the timing was um, was immaculate. So well done to, to Guardian for that, particularly with COP26 coming up. And I hopefully it'll be a, uh, um, a really interesting uh, global conference uh, of governments that will really make a difference in terms of how we, I suppose, respect and treat our environment. Thank you so much, David. Uh, we will wrap this up now, therefore. Again, the links are there for you. If you'd like to bookmark them, bookmark them. That would be really good because then you can always fall back onto, uh, uh, you know, the location where you can both ask us a question and get yourself a BIM uh, account. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here today. I could see the le the level of attendance has been good. Thank you for your attention, and uh, we're always happy to, um, you know, answer your questions, follow up questions later. A reminder: this webinar will be live on our website for you to rewatch at your own leisure in case you missed anything or if you feel like you need to go back to anything. So it will be there and you will be known. You will be um, uh, made aware through email. So we were going we're going to send you whoever attended an email that it's now live. So thank you so much, everyone, and have a
great rest of the day and and uh, from all of us here at Guardian and from David. So um, without further ado, bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.